Good day. Welcome to the 59th episode of the series <clears throat> Decolonizing the Mind. <clears throat> Today I will talk about the attack of Iran last week on Israel. But before I do that, let me remind you that today is October 7. Exactly one year ago, Hamas started the next phase in the liberation war of the people of Palestine. And I've been dealing with the impact of those attacks <clears throat> uh, in, in, in 16 episodes with the start of the series Decolonizing the Mind and in later episode after that also. Uh, but the significance of that attack, I recognize that in terms of world history. And I spent uh, the first episode with the basic question, how will the war will in Palestine end in the Free Palestine or World War Three, meaning that this war is not just a war like any other wars. It's a war that defines the future of world history. So I deal with that question in the first episode and then in the successive episodes, I give an analysis of the attack itself by Hamas, the Israeli response on it, the role of Iran, uh, Russia and the nuclear uh, bombs of Israel in relation to Iran, the role of Hezbollah in the liberation of Palestine. And I asked the question, are they going to invade Israel? And basically that is what is going on today as we speak, the attempts of Hezbollah to invade Israel in the north. The, the role of Turkey, Russia, China, India, Saudi Arabia, Egypt, USA, and Europe. Uh, I dealt with them in all these episodes, <clears throat> the preparation of a regional war by Hezbollah, the preparation of a regional war by Iran, and what if Israel decides to use uh, the nuclear bomb. Now, uh, later on I went to uh, discuss Decolonial 3 because that was the original purpose of the uh, podcast series, but because of October 7, I immediately went to the analysis of uh, geopolitics. Uh, so later episode, I'll come back to analyze the things in world history related to Palestine. Remember, one year ago, what happened was that uh, Palestine was off the agenda of world politics. What was agenda at that time was the normalization of relations between the Arab states the feudal and the dictatorial Arab states, Saudi Arabia and Qatar and others. And uh, the idea that with the Abraham Accords uh, that the Arab states would conduct with Israel, that would lead to normalization, Israel would live happy forever and the Palestinians uh, would die away. But then October 7 occurred the wall was torn down, Palestinians on motorbike right into the villages occupied by Israelis. Spectacular paragliders came out of the sky, attack on military barracks and the abduction of generals who were there in the pants. And IDF shelling the houses where Hamas militants were with Israeli hostages and they killed Israeli hostages, the IDF. Uh, the, I must say the uh, uh, Israeli occupation forces, IOF and 292 people were abducted and thousands were killed by uh, the resistance. Now, last week, Iran attacked Israel. <clears throat> it fired 200 ballistic missiles toward military infrastructure, meaning the Mossad headquarters, two air bases, uh, the headquarters of espionage and intelligence, and it was, uh, a response to the assassination of Ismail Hani of Hamas in Tehran and the assassination of um, Hassan Nasrallah uh, in Beirut. And the immediate response of Israel and the United States was to mitigate this attack and say it was not effective, uh, it didn't achieve anything, it was a failure. But many people in those areas posted videos uh, of uh, the rockets falling down uh, in occupied Palestine <clears throat> and a few were shot 
down by the Israel defense, but the overwhelming majority, you could see it on the video, hit the ground. Now you could doubt even those videos, but in the National Public Radio and American Public Broadcasting Companies used researchers that took imagery from a commercial satellite company, Planet, and they identified more than 30 points where Israeli missiles appear to have impacted just one airbase, the Nefertam Air Base. <clears throat> and based on their preliminary calculation of what happened at Nefertam, they said that a substantial number of Iranian missile, missiles have reached their target, and they, they estimated that more than half would have reached the target. Uh, the Iranian version is that 90% uh, reached their target, and obviously the Iranians are uh, monitoring this for, from their satellites from above, and I guess they might even have, uh, you know, um, instruments uh, on board of the missiles uh, that might register those things also. So there were three main uh, air bases, uh, two, two were attacked uh, and the Mossad Center, and there are reports of uh, 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 aircrafts that have been bombed. Um, now, people might ask, why did it took so long for Iran uh, to, to take this step? Uh, they announced it after the murder of Ismail Haniye that they would do it, but they didn't. And after the murder of uh, Hassan Nasriya, they uh, said they would come and they, and they did it after that. <clears throat> so people are thinking, Iran is just not prepared for a war and doesn't uh, want to engage uh, if they are attacked. So they'd rather uh, take the blow. Um, and some people even criticize that Iran is on the sideline of what's going on. <clears throat> just one simple fact. When Nasrallah was killed, there was an Iranian general, General Abbas Nilfurusham, who was killed with him. He was there at the spot. What was he doing there if Iran is on the sideline? You know, Iranians are communicated on a daily, maybe hourly basis with the whole axis of resistance. They are coordinating it. They are supplying weapons. Uh, 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 they are strategizing. So don't think that nothing is happening there within the military and political circus, uh, circles of Iran. So what are their considerations? Because when they look at the war, they don't see only Israel. It's a war against the United States with 500,000 500, nuclear weapons. So in order to wage a war, you have to take the end game into account. What is the end game? <clears throat> and the Iranians have said the end game is basically the liberation of the land of Palestine, meaning the destruction of the Zionist state of Israel. How will this come about? And I talked in a previous video about it, that at the end of the day, it will be the reoccupation of the lands of Palestine, meaning Palestinians, axis of resistance people on the ground in Israel, in occupied Palestine, taking over the cities, taking over uh, the, the, the settlers, uh, uh, communities, uh, that's the end game. But uh, uh, is the access of recession prepared to do it now? Or what are uh, other considerations? One is obviously a political consideration, which is unity among Muslims and unity among the anti imperialist forces in the world. And that is not a simple task, but imagine that the, the uh, Saudi Arabia and the Arab states were supporting Israel, even Turkey, you know, is supporting Israel in uh, uh, with, with the, uh, they, they have gas and all that they deliver to Israel, which they could cut off any, any time uh, what they want. So Turkey is talking a lot, but in practice, it's supporting Israel. So you, you have to take into account that building that anti-imperialist unity 
uh, is very important. And one day before the strike, the Russian uh, uh, prime minister was uh, in Iran. <clears throat> and obviously they, they, they strategize about how the anti-imperial struggle will continue. So it's not just because uh, Israel has killed so many people, you jump up and you then uh, strike Israel and, and kill also Israeli civilians. That is not a strategy, that is emotion. Now, um, then the important thing is that once a strike takes place, Israel, Netanyahu said, we're going to hit you hard. And some analysts were expecting it within 24 hours, others were expecting it within 48 hours, and uh, no, nothing came. Um, but they keep threatening, saying that all options are uh, on the table, including strikes on nuclear and oil production facilities. And they will target Iranian revolutionary guards, uh, leaders, uh, uh, and uh, uh, Bennett, one of the leaders of the far right party in Israel, wrote an X after the Iranians' missiles barrage. We must act now to destroy Iran's nuclear program, its central energy facilities, and to fatally cripple the, this terrorist regime. We have the justification, we have the tools now that Hezbollah and Hamas are paralyzed, Iran stands exposed. Well, it's wrong in Hezbollah and Hamas being paralyzed, they are alive and kicking. Hezbollah uh, is firing rockets every day into Israel and uh, and today uh, and this morning they even tried to invade the north of uh, uh, Israel uh, of occupied Palestine so he, he's wrong on that but he's basically saying you know we, we are going to attack the nuclear program and oil facilities etc now my dear friend Mohammed Marandi uh, sat in on a YouTube interview yesterday that the nuclear facilities are deep underground in there are underground cities in in uh, uh, Western Asia, in Iran, in Iraq, in uh, Syria, in uh, uh, Palestine, in uh, uh, Lebanon, in in uh, Yemen. Uh, they have learned that you know uh, they should keep their military capabilities underground because of the air superiority that Israel has, supported by uh, by the United States and the West. So Israel is doing a lot of damage, uh, mainly economically and in civilian lives, but military, it, it's weak, it doesn't achieve much. Now, this threat of attacking Iran's nuclear facilities dates a long time ago, in 2003, 20, 21 years ago, there was a project Daniels in Israel to assess the threat from Iran in other countries. And there already they, they put out a policy of to carry out preemptive strikes against nuclear facilities. But they they haven't done it in those 20, they didn't dare it. Not It's not that they don't want it, they don't dare it. And in their imagination, you know, there is what they call assumption option, one of the episodes what I deal with is going to the Samson option. And the Samson option means Israel goes down and the rest of West Asia goes down with a nuclear holocaust. The, Israel has 90 nuclear weapons and all these weapons will be used uh, to bomb uh, uh, Syria, Yemen, Iran, of course, uh, mainly Iran, uh, Iraq, uh, etc. Bomb all the nuclear weapons, uh, use all the nuclear weapons. And Samson refers to the biblical story of the Israelite judge Samson who pushed apart the pillars uh, of uh, a Philistine temple, temple, bringing down the roof and killing himself and thousands of Philistines who had captured him and crying out, let me die with the Philistines. So Israel thinks they are going to use the nuclear weapons when the time comes there. Now, what is the Iranian counter response? Uh, the deputy commander of the Revolutionary Guards, Admiral Ali Fadafi, warned Israel that uh, they have struck last week uh, the military infrastructure. The next is the economic infrastructure. And mind you, the economic infrastructure, he said, you have only three power stations and several refineries. 
we can strike them that you can strike them all at once and iran is a large country with many economic centers so uh, we could cripple your economy in one blow and if you make this mistake we'll target all your energy resources power plants refineries gas field so uh, don't take it light and Mohammed Randi said in one of his interview, we feel that uh, Iran might change the nuclear doctrine. For now, Iran says we don't want a nuclear weapon. But if this attack occurs with the support of the United States, of course, on the oil refineries, then Iran might change its doctrine and say we're going to develop nuclear weapons and we're going to develop it very fast. So keep in mind that um, the Iranians know very well the nuclear facilities of Iran and one of the most interesting things which I found on the website of the English face of fast news which is uh, you know um, a website that gives you a lot of information of the revolutionary regards they published an, an image that says if you fire we will fire back and that image contains all the locations uh, the most important locations that they could hit and especially the nuclear facilities uh, in Rafael uh, company the main place where they assemble nuclear weapons they put a dot there uh, in Haifa uh, the largest port the location of uh, the largest refinery in Tel Aviv, the economic capital, but then uh, you have the nuclear weapons storage base in Ilabon, in the uh, storage place of nuclear weapons in Seduk Mika base. They know it all. Imagine that they strike these nuclear bases with their weapons and, and a nuclear holocaust happens in Israel. Obviously, there are Palestinians living in occupied Palestine, so, you know, uh, it will impact them. It's not an easy decision to take. But guess what? If they go for the idea of assumption options, it might turn on them. So, um, as I, I mentioned, Mohamed Marandi, before, a dear friend of mine, uh, look at his videos at YouTube because he gives magnificent decolonial analysis uh, of what's going on in Western Asian and world politics and he gives a voice, he's a voice of the Iranian resistance in Western media uh, and if you want to understand Iranian thinking look at uh, his videos on YouTube and on social media. As I said this series started with explaining the theoretical framework of decolonizing the mind in the book and in the book I, I discuss all these things uh, the, uh, if you look at Hezbollah or if you look at Iran in the index, uh, you, could, you could find it. And this PDF you could download at my website, sondayura.com. And if you want to support uh, the website, subscribe to the channel, share it with friends, family and colleagues. Encourage them to subscribe, get involved in the discussion group or make a donation at sondayura.com. Thank you for your attention and hope to see you next week.